Okay, this video is a follow-up to our analysis of variance. So one of the things that you probably noticed is that if we get a significant treatment effect, for, let's say for varieties we get the F value of 92.9 or something like that, so a highly significant effect, this actually doesn't give you the information that you need. In, in many cases you still want to know which variety is actually better than another. So ANOVA didn't give us this information. And if you want it, you're actually back to t-tests. So you have to do pairwise comparisons, A versus B, A versus C, B versus C. And uh, you may ask, you know, what's the point of uh, doing an ANOVA then in the first place if I have to do t-tests anyways. But there are two really important twists here uh, in those follow-up pairwise comparisons. One is uh, you gain statistical power uh, by using a pooled variance. Um, that's a big advantage over just a plain t-test. So this gives you more power, but there's also a danger here that we have to consider, and that's type 1 error inflation. So if you do multiple pairwise comparisons, uh, you always have a small chance that uh, you're wrong, right? And those add up if you do many tests. So we have to think about an experiment-wise alpha level. So how do we maintain this? If I don't want to be wrong uh, overall, 95% of the time, uh, we have to think about our p-values. So this video has some important new concepts, uh, so namely type 1 error inflation. So the analysis of variance we could derive without any anything new, right? So we could just apply what we've learned so far. But this one has some interesting new insights. So let's start with the type 1 error inflation. The idea is if I do one t-test, let's say compare variety A and B, if I set an alpha level of 0 0.05, I have a 5% chance of being wrong about this being a significant difference. And if I do three tests, so in this case I would have to compare A and B, A and C, and B and C, those errors add up. They don't actually add up exactly, so we can calculate that in a minute. But if I want to be sure that over all those comparisons I maintain my alpha level of 0 0.05, so I only want uh, 1 out of 20 false positives, then we have to make some adjustments. And uh, so let's calculate what our chances are to actually make a mistake if I do three comparisons. So they, they don't actually add up exactly. So if they were to add up, then if I had 21 comparisons, that would be probability of 105% <laughs> chance that I make an error. Uh, and, and that is not quite right. So the way you calculate this is actually quite clever. Instead of calculating the probability of making an error, you actually calculate the probability of making no errors. So if I do one comparison, my probability of making no errors is 0.95, and then I can multiply those for three comparisons. So, so 0.95 three times by itself would give me an 86% chance that I make no errors. And that also means that the probability of making one or more errors is the opposite of this, right? So 0 0.14. So that's a cool calculation. So it works with the 9.5, this is 1 minus alpha. I multiply this value as many times as I do the comparison, so that's to the power of 3 in this case. And then it's 1 minus all that is my uh, probability of making at least one error. So what happens if I if I have more than three treatment levels? There's a formula that uh, to get the number of pairwise comparisons that you actually have to carry out. Uh, that's a combinatorics formula. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. So it's the number of treatment levels times the number of treatment levels minus one divided by two. So if I plug in three treatment levels, I get three times two is six divided by two is three. And that's what we had up here. Now if I plug in six treatment levels, so A, B, C, D, E, F, the, the number of comparisons uh, skyrocket very quickly. So six times five is 30 divided by two is 15. And if I plug this into my formula here, so one minus 0 0.95 to the power of 15, I got a more than 50% chance that I have one or more false positives. So that's not good. If I were to do this without any adjustments to my alpha level, I'd be wrong more than half of the time. So that, that is really something we have to worry about uh, as the number of comparisons increase. But even with three comparisons, right, this is still uh, a considerable problem. So I'm working with, with an alpha level of 0 0.14 instead of 0 0.5 if I didn't know what I was doing. But there's an easy fix. So Bonferroni is a statistician who came up with this. So what you do is you just divide the alpha level 
that you want by the number of comparisons. So if you do 0 0.05 divided by 15, uh, you get a 0 0.00333 um, new alpha value, and that you should use instead of the 0 0.5, and that will give you an experiment-wise alpha level of 0 0.05. So we can check if that's true. So I can plug this into my formula here and calculate the experiment-wise alpha level. So if, we, if I use this as a threshold to cut off what's significant, so 1 minus this uh, to the power of 15, 1 minus, gives me 0 0.0489. So that checks out approximately. So it's not an exact solution, but it's simple and it's close. So that's why it's being still used despite there being better methods. So let's check out an R just for fun if this actually works. So we'll uh, do this with a little simulation. We'll do 15 pairwise comparisons for uh, six treatment levels. And what we want is an alpha of 0 0.05, so we only want to make a mistake one out of 20 times. And we'll see if that if, if we only accept positives at this Bonferroni adjusted p-value, if we end up being right. Uh, so I don't get marks for creativity. You've seen this simulation about a half dozen times. So I create 100,000 trees with a height of 15 and a standard deviation of 3. Um, so let's run this. And uh, there's my population. And now let's take a sample. Uh, we've done this before. So I set my sample size to n equals 10. I'm going to just pick trees randomly. Let's just briefly look at all my trees. There they are. Now what I'm going to do is I sample that population again. Um, so that is exactly the same code, and I'm calling that one B. So maybe that represents a treatment that has absolutely no effect, treatment A and treatment B. So I do something to my trees, and I want to see if uh, that has an effect. But uh, in my simulation, it doesn't, right? So because I'm just sampling the same population. And now I'm going to run the t-test and see if I get a significant difference. I shouldn't, right? So let's check it out. So we get a p-value of uh, 0 0.7, not significant, uh, so no problem. Uh, but let's see what happens if we uh, run this now multiple times, so 15 comparisons. So keep an eye on this p-value here. I count the runs. So we already did one, two, oh, there. Already a significant result, right? False positive. Wow. Uh, three, that's good. Four five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Oh, one more. Fifteen. So we got one false positive. But it was a 0 0.03, right? So not, not a big deal. If we follow Bonferroni, we wouldn't have fallen for that false positive, right? It would have passed this alpha level, but not this one. So we were protected. Okay, so that was good. Bonferroni passed the test, but now let's see what happens if we crank up this sample size here to a thousand. You know, do we still get those false positive even with uh, very large sample sizes? Uh, so let's run this. So we're working with n equals thousand. And I count them out again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There, false positive again. Nine, ten, eleven. Oh, look at this. Point zero zero six. So second false positive <laughs> and highly significant even with a very large sample size so where were we at 10 or something uh, 11 12 13 14 15. so you see uh, this problem does not go away with bigger sample sizes but bonferroni did the job bonferroni just passed the 0 0.006 <laughs> close I definitely could still make a type 1 error, even with the adjustment, right? But that chance is 1 out of 20. So if I did this job of counting to 15 20 times, then I expect that one of those runs uh, 
might get a p-value that's even smaller than this. But in those two that we did, Bonferroni protected us from false conclusions. Um, so play with this uh, little piece of code here for yourself, if you like. Um, it's actually a lovely in-class exercise. Um, if you have 36 students cranking away at this for like 10 minutes, you get absolutely outlandish p-values, right? That that nobody would doubt, right? So you get 0 0.000001 uh, and, and everybody would conclude, oh, oh, this is a major discovery, this is super important, uh, big effect. But really what you've done is uh, you just repeatedly sampled a uh, random distribution where there's nothing in it, there's no differences whatsoever. So that is a danger. Um, so you're only doing your experiment once and you get a, a couple of p-values. If you draw conclusions uh, from those p-values and they've been jumping around like crazy here, right? That is not the way to do it, right? So don't pay too much attention to those p-values. Uh, what we really care about are those confidence intervals and I will show you um, in the next video how you can draw rock solid inferences despite that apparent craziness that's uh, going on here with the p-values. So that adjustment for pairwise comparisons, it's also referred to as adjustment for multiple inference. And um, it's actually a much broader principle that uh, not only applies to pairwise comparisons, but also to how you do research yourself and how science works in general. So there are problems revolving around uh, relying on those unadjusted p-values that go beyond just those pairwise tests. So that's illustrated by this little cartoon here. Uh, jelly beans cause acne, scientists investigate. We found no link between jelly beans and acne, p0.05. Uh, that settles that. I hear it's only certain colors that cause it. And then they go, right? We found no link between purple jelly beans and acne and so on and so on. So you go through all the colors and of course, by random chance, you will get a false positives eventually, right? And that gets published. If you believe in p-values, green jelly beans linked to acne. There we go. So this is unfortunately how uh, things work sometimes. And it can actually also apply to your own research. If you do a lot of tinkering and you try this and you try that, and you do this test and you do that test, so if you, if you don't have that discipline to stick to a planned experiment and a planned analysis, or similarly, if your research actually involves carrying out a lot of individual tests, right? So you might have a whole pile of variables uh, and you check for correlations among them, uh, you will get these false positives all the time. And um, uh, in that case, you would have to do those sequential Bonferroni adjustments. So we'll come back to this when we cover correlation and regression analysis, because that, that is very often that you're looking for associations uh, among multiple variables, and then this happens. Now, this multiple inference problem is also something that is a broader issue in science as well. And um, it, it is widely recognized. Um, there's actually a, a beautiful article uh, that's actually a magazine article out of the New Yorker magazine that's entitled The Tooth Wears Off. And it's it's very subtle. It, it follows the story of a, a scientist who, with the best intention, discovered uh, an enormously important drug in the U.S. And um, the interesting thing is that his results were actually replicated by other research groups and confirmed. And only over the course of quite a long time, people figured out that that was a false positive. So for a certain time, it was one of the most popular drugs in the US. And there are other mechanisms that sometimes delay the correction of, of uh, false positives. So it's a, it's a very interesting article to read. And I, I recommend it. I posted it here, 10 urlcom rr 480 reading Lehrer uh, 2010. So if you're so inclined, have a look at this. Obviously, this is not um, required reading or anything like that. Um, in any case, we should come back and wrap up our pairwise comparisons. So what we can conclude here is that there are actually two ways to control for your experiment-wise alpha level. One is ANOVA itself. Uh, so if you don't get a significant treatment effect, don't proceed to pairwise comparisons after you carefully thought about your alpha level. 
If it does pass the bar and you proceed to pairwise comparisons, you still would have to do those Bonferroni adjustments, or they're actually better adjustments. Uh, sequential Bonferroni is one of them that we'll uh, cover later, or Tricky's Honest Significant Difference. So those are more, slightly more sophisticated adjustments, but exactly the same idea as this one.